How you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is topic 2.2 where we look at how do we write electron configurations and there's actually a bit in this one so the video is a bit long. I do apologize but we've got to get through it. Let's go. Okay, topic 2.2, how do we write electron configurations? We look at the number of electrons in the shells, the S, P, F and D energy levels and then we talk about orbitals and orbital level diagrams. So topic 2.2, electron configurations, there's actually quite a bit in this one. We need to talk about how the shells can hold a maximum number of electrons. We look at splitting the energy levels into S, P, D and F. We look at orbitals and the regions of space which electrons can be found in. And then we need to know the shapes of some S and P orbitals and then apply some principles that allow us to write electron configurations. So here was Rutherford's experiment where he determined his model for the solar system, which was then proven to be incorrect by his partner in crime, James Bohr. Bohr recognised the limitations of the model and proposed his own, and he said that atoms circled the nucleus without losing energy, or electrons circled the nucleus without losing energy, and they could only be moved in regions of fixed energy which he called orbitals. He also said that the electrons would fill the shells with the lowest energy first, and that the further away from the nucleus you got, the higher the energy of the shell, or the higher energy of the electrons. So the electrons that were closer to the nucleus were more tightly held and they had lower energy than the electrons that were found in the valence shell. Now the valence shell is the outermost electron shell, and they're described as the valence electron. They have more energy, they're further away from the nucleus. In earlier chemistry courses you've probably been shown how to write electron configurations according to Bohr's model and we're quickly going to go over that now. So remember in the first shell it can hold a maximum of two electrons. We have two electrons in the first shell. In the second shell we can have eight. In the third shell we can have 18. In the fourth shell we can have 32. If we have n shells the formula for the number of electrons is 2n squared. So in a previous course you might have been asked to write the electron configuration of silicon. Silicon is right directly below carbon and has 14 electrons. So we can look at the periods to work out the number of electrons. So there's two electrons in the first shell which is the full first period. There are eight electrons in the second period so we have eight electrons in the shell, it's full. We move on to the third shell and it only occupies four. Calcium. Calcium is a much bigger atom. It has 20 electrons. So we have to go through and fill the shells according to the rules. So we have two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell. Now the 18, the third shell can take 18 electrons, but we can never write more than eight in the outer shell. We have to put two in the fourth shell because the third shell is unstable if it has more than eight electrons as the valence shell. Those extra electrons, where do they come from? They actually come from the transition metals. So after calcium, you'll see that we move into the transition metals and they are the remaining electrons that are present in the third shell. So after calcium, that's when we start placing electrons back into that third shell and filling it up. But we have to have those two electrons in the fourth shell before we're able to place any more electrons in the third shell. So nickel. Nickel is a transition metal. That means that it is going to have more than eight electrons in the third shell. So we go about this the same way. Two, eight, and then I'm going to leave it blank because I don't know how many electrons I need in that third shell just yet. But I know I've got to put two in the outer shell first. So I put two electrons in my fourth shell and now I can go back to my third shell and figure out how many more electrons I need. So how many electrons do I need to get to nickel? Well, I've got my eighth in my third period, and then I need to go across using the periodic table, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So nickel would have 16 electrons in the third shell. It's a transition metal, so those transition metals fill electrons 9 through to 18 of the third shell. A magnesium ion, well that's a magnesium atom that has lost two electrons. So normally magnesium would have 12 electrons, but now it's only got 10. So the electron configuration for a magnesium ion would be 2, 8. 
A fluoride ion is a fluorine atom that has gained one electron. So that means it's got one extra. Normally fluorine has nine, but now it's got 10. So it will have a electron configuration of two, eight as well. Notice that these two things are the same. This is called electrovalent. So these two atoms or ions now would be called electrovalent because they have the same electron configuration. Now, Bohr's model worked really well for describing small atoms like hydrogen and their, uh, their emission spectrum, but it had a lot of flaws with heavier ev elements. So now we say that we don't know exactly where an electron will be. We use a probability model and we can predict approximately where we might find that electron. So the quantum mechanic model is now the most accurate description of how we write an electron configuration. And we say that the atom consists of shells, and then within the shells we have these regions of different energy called subshells. Now, for each shell we have that many different subshells. So for instance, shell 1 has only one subshell, and that's known as an S. So the first shell has one type of subshell, which is an S subshell. Now an S subshell can only hold two electrons. In the second shell, we have two different types of subshells. We have an S subshell and a P subshell. In the third shell, we have three different subshells, an S, a P, and a D. In the fourth shell, we have four different subshells, an S, a P, a D, and an F. You get the idea, there's a repeating pattern here. Now with the number of electrons, an S subshell can only hold two electrons. A P subshell, well that can hold six electrons. A D subshell, it can hold 10, and an F can hold 14. So we're gonna use this model now to write electron configurations, and in IB chemistry, these are the only electron configurations you're able to write. Now the electrons fill up these, sub these shells and subshells in a very specific order, with the lowest energy shells and subshells filling first. So the first subshell that the first shell that fills is the first shell, and the S subshell is what fills first. So hydrogen is the 1s1, helium is the 1s2. Now that is now a full shell and a full subshell. So we move to the next period. So the next period, the next lowest energy is the 2s. So lithium and beryllium start to fill up the 2s1 and 2s2. Now we move over to the P subshell. So the 2P subshell starts with boron and ends with neon. So boron is the 2P1, neon is the 2P6. You can now think about how the periodic use table used to be named. They used to call group 1 and 2 the S block, and they used to call group 13 to 18 the P block, because they were filling those particular subshells. Moving down, now we have the 3s1 and the 3s2, and then moving over to the P block, we would have the 3p1 of aluminium, and then the 3p8 for, 3p6 for argon. We move down, the next lowest energy to fill is the 4s. So we need to put our two electrons in the fourth shell before we can fill up the rest of the third shell. And that's what we do for potassium and calcium. Then we get into the transition metals. So remember back before I said you can have no more than eight electrons in the outer shell, so the same rule applies here. So the transition metals start to fill the remaining electrons in the third shell, and this is known as the d orbital. So we start with 3d1, and then we go all, to, all the way to 3d10 with the zinc. The transition metals used to be known as the d block. The, there were d block elements, the transition metals. So we've got to follow this pattern of filling in terms of lowest energy first. And if you follow the periodic table, you will always fill the electrons with the lowest energy. Just remember that you can only ever have, you can, oh, sorry, you can never have more than eight electrons in the outer shell. So you've got to put two electrons in the fourth shell before you can start filling up the D subshell. After we get through that first bit of transition metals, we would move into the 4P section. So we'd have 4P1 and then 4P6 with our noble gas. That's as far as you need to go in the IB course. So let's practice a few. 
So write the following full electronic configuration for boron, and that's the words they'll use, the full electronic configuration. Boron has five electrons, so we've got to fill those five electrons according to energy. So we start off with the 1s. The 1s can hold two electrons, so it's 1s2. Then we move down to the next lowest in energy, which is the 2s. So we have 2s and s can hold two, so it's a 1s2, 2s2. I've got one electron remaining, so I must have one electron in the 2p. If I count the little numbers, I get the number of electrons. Argon. Argon has 18 electrons, so it's a lot bigger. So it will have two electrons in the first 1s shell, two electrons in the second 2s shell. It will have six electrons in the 2p shell, subshell. It will have two electrons in the 3s subshell, and its 3p subshell will also be full, giving us 18 electrons. Now, the IB might ask you for the condensed electronic configuration. That means that we can use square brackets to represent one of the noble gases. In this case, we can use square brackets to represent the electron configuration of argon as being above, and that's 18 electrons. So we have argon, which is the 18 electrons, and now we've got to fill in the remaining electrons. So after the 3p, we need to move to the 4s. So we would have two electrons in the 4s, that gives us 20 electrons. So the remaining electrons, the remaining six electrons, must be in the 3d. So we have 4s2, 3d, 6. That's the electron configuration of iron. Now there are two important exceptions that we need to be aware of in the transition metals. The first is chromium. Normally chromium would be written according to the energy levels. It would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, which is argon. 4s2, and then the remaining electrons in the 3d, so it would be 3d4. But in fact, that particular arrangement is not a stable arrangement. What chromium will do is it will promote one of its 4s electrons into an empty 3d. Now, the reason it does that is because a half-filled 3d orbital is a lot stable, a lot more stable than a partially filled 3d orbital. So it promotes one electron from the 4s to the 3d, giving it 4s1, 3d5. And that's a more stable arrangement. And that's how you'll find it written on periodic tables. Half filled is a lot more stable than being partially filled. And we have a few other rules as well. If we have a full subshell, that is a stable orbital. A half filled orbital, that is stable as well. I mean subshell, sorry. If we have a full subshell, that is stable. If we have a half filled subshell, that is stable. And if we have an empty subshell, that is stable. So if we look at copper, copper is also an exception. It would be 4s2, 3d9. So you can see here that that d subshell is partially filled. But copper could promote one electron from the 4s to give it a full 3d subshell. That means it's going to be a lot more stable than having a partially filled orbital. So it will promote that one electron, giving it the configuration of argon, 4s1, 3d10, which is a full 3d and a half filled 4s. So that is a stable configuration. So now we've got to talk about orbitals, and sometimes I get mixed up between shells and orbitals, so I do apologise. Now an orbital is a region of space where we will find the electrons, and the orbitals have different shapes depending upon if they're an S, a P, and a D. Now there's some rules surrounding orbitals. An orbital can contain a maximum of two electrons. That means it can either have zero, one, or two. So a P subshell, for instance, can hold six electrons, which means that it has a maximum of three orbitals. And we can fill those orbitals in a very specific way. So carbon has six electrons. That means it has two electrons in the 1s, and they have opposite spins. So we have one electron spinning down, one electron spinning up. It has two electrons in the 2s, so again we have one spinning down, one spinning up. Now that, that means I've got two electrons remaining. 
Now those two electrons will want to be in different orbitals until they're forced to pair up. So we would have one electron in one orbital and another electron in another orbital. Think of them as beds and the electrons don't want to sleep together until they're forced to sleep together. If we have something like phosphorus, phosphorus has 15 electrons. So it has a full 1s, a full 2s, it will have a full 2p, so that means that there will be 6 electrons in the 2p. It will have a full 3s, but it's 3p, well there's a few things that could happen. The, the main thing that will happen is the electrons will remain unpaired until we have more than 3, because there's only 3 orbitals in a p subshell. So those electrons remain unpaired until we have more than three electrons in that P subshell. Now the spin just indicates the direction of the electron spinning and the electron spins will all be the same until we start to pair them up. So here are our exceptions with chromium, which I'm just gonna run through very quickly. If we have our electron configuration of argon, that, are, that is a full subshell and full orbitals all the way up to the end of the 3p. Now with the 4s, it would normally have two electrons in its 4s, and it would have four electrons in its 3d. The 3d can have five different orbitals, so that would be partially filled. But what the chromium will do is it will take one electron from the 4s and promote that into the 3d. So we can see that the one electron is promoted to the 3d orbital, which is now half filled. Our 4s is also half filled, so that's a stable arrangement. Copper will do the exact same thing. It will have a full electron configuration up to the end of the 3p, and it has nine electrons in the 3d. So that means that all of the electrons will be paired except for the last one. So it will promote an electron from the 4s and place that in the 3d, leaving the 3d now full. All of the orbitals have two electrons in it, and it's a full 3d subshell. That is a stable subshell, the 4s is half filled, so both of those are stable, and that is why both chromium and copper have stable electron configurations, which are slightly different from what you would expect. If you're asked to draw something like this, this is called an orbital diagram. The last thing you need to know for this video is what do these orbitals actually look like? And you need to know what an S orbital looks like, the shape of it, and a P orbital. Now an S orbital just looks like a sphere in three dimensions. So it's a sphere which crosses three of the axes, X, Y, and Z. A P orbital, well there are three P orbitals, and the P orbitals look like a little infinity sign. The infinity sign must contain what we call a lobe, and you must show the lobes really clear, clearly on your diagram. So if you are asked to draw an orbital, make sure that they have that lobe in the middle, and the three orbitals sit on the X, the Y, and then the Z in three dimensions. In this arrangement, the electrons have maximized their distance. So we have the PX orbital, which runs on the X axis, the PY orbital, which runs on the Y axis, and the PZ orbital, which runs on the Z axis. Okay, topic 2.2, some top tips. S, P, F, and D configurations only from here on in. Look for the words full or condensed, and if it's asked for orbital diagrams, it means it wants you to draw boxes. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more. Apologies for the length. I'll see you next time.